difference these days between big data analytics and, and analytics of an earlier period? I mean, companies have been trying to do data mining for, for a long time. That's not really a new idea, but suddenly we have this, this buzzword called big data analytics. I mean, what, what's new about analytics these days? Well, there, there's a lot that is the same, but what, what, we're, what we're looking at is different ways of being able to do predictive modeling, much more sophisticated capabilities. And for example, if you think about um, unstructured data, text, textual data, say in emails, in social, social media information, and being able to create, to add the sort of analysis of that type of data into your model building. Um, one example where this is being done is in uh, looking at customer sentiment. Hmm. So really getting an early warning or, or, or really listening to your customers and not and doing that by um, building perhaps, perhaps building predictive models that take into account changes in uh, what say tweets and uh, blogs and all of the unstructured data that's available. That's one major change. I'm sure f and uh, Fern, who is doing a lot of uh, sort of analytics, many you know, f as you said a long time ago, might want. Yeah, I mean, actually, that was a question that I thought a lot about when we were writing the big data for dummies books. You know, what's really different? What's different about big data analytics and you know, so on the one hand, organizations are really extending, um, you know, what they've been doing with analytics. Maybe they, they're doing it faster and more accurately. You know, maybe they're using a model for churn that took 20 hours to run before they put their big data infrastructure in place, and now it takes minutes to run. You know, so they're doing what they did before, but they're doing it faster and they're doing it better. You know, on the other hand, they're doing new things, you know, all sorts of new types of analytics. Um, so, Marsha mentioned one example. I mean, I know of a couple of examples, like an automobile, well, more than a couple, but, you know, an automobile manufacturer might be taking um, telemetric sensor data from its automobiles and then marrying that together with other data for preventative maintenance, as an example. Interesting. Um, I see we, we may have lost, uh, yeah, and, and, and there's Judith. Judith, Judith yes, ha ha happy to see you okay, back. Good. Yeah. I'm back. Yeah, uh, you know, it, you know we're, we're talking about uh, you know what's the difference between you know big data analytics and analytics of an earlier yeah. time. I mean, what, what's your sense of that? So one of the differences is when when you you know when you have a small amount of data and you sort of know what you're doing. You're you know it's customer data and you want to ask a questions. How many customers do I have in the northeast corner of a state? Mm -hmm. So you you know to to ask a query and you'll get the answer back seventeen. But if you have a massive amount of data, you're going to be more likely to be looking at uh, patterns. So, so this is where the issue of using data visualization as an analytical tool, because again, if you're looking for patterns and anomalies, they'll be more likely to show up if you can visualize that data. And there, there are a lot of visualization uh, tools in the market that are very useful in that context. Yeah, it's interesting about the visualization. This is a tangent, but I think it's an interesting one in that visualization allows different people in the company to actually access the data. It makes it easier to read and understand if it's put in this in this visual form as opposed to like a spreadsheet with all sorts of numbers. It's almost like it, it sort of spreads the power around the, 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 the data analysis power. It's not just a C-suite. It might be staffers and, and you know lower level IT people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Fern, are you going to add, add something there? No, I was just agreeing about you know, visualization can help actually, you know, democratize analytics in some way. It's not advanced analytics, but right. you know, it's actually helping. I guess it also depends how you define advanced analytics, but you know, certainly doing visualizations over large volumes of disparate data, you know, or visualizations in real time that requires some pretty advanced technology, even if on the end user. Um, you know, from from the end user perspective, you know, it's it's simpler than you know doing some sort of predictive model. You know, as an example, it's more about discovery. But to Judith's point, you know, about all of this data, I think that's also what's interesting about what's different is that in the past, you did a lot of hypothesis, sort of hypothesis um, focused 
an analysis, you know, because you didn't have the compute power to just sort of go out there and, and do, you know, discovery. And now you can do much more discovery. People call that hypothesis-free, you know, analysis. There's a debate about it, you know, where you just sort of set the algorithms to work on the data and come up um, with with patterns as opposed to saying, I have this hypothesis and then go out and testing it. So, you know, uh, that's another difference. In other words, it's, it's hypothesis-free. You don't even need to ask the question and the, and the data... The data cruncher is giving you information. Well, theoretically, but it, you know, you still need to have some idea of what's going on. You know, right. so you can get your data together to even, you know, put it into, um, you but, know, an algorithm that would. But I, I think it, you you actually make an important point. Uh, big data is is less influenced by I want to ask a specific question. You really look, you know, what, once you get a handle on the data, once it gets to small. So once you get to the point where you're no longer dealing with the three petabytes of data, where you get it down to a subset of that data, and you make sure that, that putting that data together actually makes sense, at that point, um, you, you have a better idea of what questions to ask. Or maybe you, you start by saying, OK, what patterns are here? What what can I see that I didn't see before? And at that point, you can start asking questions. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is one reason why storage is is taking on a new role in terms of big data. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I've we've talked to a lot of companies that said, we in the past we used to store and save a lot of data that we really didn't weren't sure. Perhaps it was sensor data. They weren't sure really what they were going to do with it and now have this new ability to um, look for patterns, ask questions that they weren't even thinking of before, and seeing sort of new uses for data that in the past, you know, was maybe really was not delivering any value. And so there is an increased um, interest in storing more data.